But I do think listen as much as you can and really have those open conversations and try and keep yourself as open-minded. Always learning, never stop learning. I've just continued to absorb more information. Welcome to another Content in Business podcast episode. And this one is a spotlight session with Sam Eastcott, the founder and managing director of The Circular Studio. The Circular Studio is a fluid community space that aims to offer local opportunities in fashion while rethinking waste. Welcome to the show, Sam. Thank you very much for having me. Glad to get through that first sentence without fluffing it up. <laughs> <laughs> Well, carry on and tell us about the Circular Studio. Yeah, so as you you guys know, I was in a different role um, May last year, and I ended up leaving that role quite quickly. And um, I found myself in a situation where I needed to pay my rent. And so one of the things I had been doing sort of on the side was buying and reselling clothes. And so I just went sort of head dive into that and just started buying a few more clothes. I started mainly with trainers. I think I went into a charity shop, found a, pa a pair of trainers for seven pounds. Thought, oh, I wonder if I can resell these, cleaned them up and resold them for 22 quid in about half an hour. I thought, okay, maybe I could do something a little bit to help myself cover the rent. And then um, fast forward to two months later, my first month I'd made 800 pounds. I thought, okay, that, that's definitely covered my rent. I only needed to find 500, so I was 300 in profit. So I was like, okay, cool. Maybe I could try this for another month. And I did the same. And we got to a point personally where it was either stay in England or move back to Wales. And just with the cost of living in England, we just thought it was a no brainer really. So we moved back to Wales and I ended up filling my old bedroom with a bunch of clothes and shoes. And it got to the point where my boyfriend was kind of like, okay, this is getting a bit, it's getting a bit much now. I was like, yeah, fair enough. And so I saw a space in Caerphilly, um, which is where I'm from locally. And the sort of idea for the circular studio came from just seeing the space. I went in and I thought, oh, this is quite a nice space. It was right in the center of town, off on the side street, which I thought it's nice to be off the beaten track. Some of the best things are always there. And I thought I can run workshops from here. I could sell from the shop. I could create a little space and it could sort of become a multifunctional space. And one of the biggest pain points for me as a fashion student from Wales was there are no opportunities in fashion in this country, very limited. Um, I think there's peacocks in Cardiff. Um, so I really wanted to give the same opportunity to people that I really wanted without having to move to a major city just because of the cost of living. So I randomly, I just took on this space and I filled it with my clothes and I took on the space in October and it felt like the longest time to get it open because I was moving all of the stuff from my family home into this space in my tiny Toyota car. <laughs> <laughs> it felt like it took ages and I finally opened the doors in January for secondhand Saturday which I only open one day a week and the response has been amazing. I've exceeded sales growth that I anticipated. I only expected to sell maybe 90 pounds worth, you know, for the month. Um, we've done well over 300 and um, the reach on social media has been insane. Uh, it's just gone from there. It's been one of a whirlwind. The idea sort of came about in that October when I saw the space and since then it's just transformed into a yeah. little ecosystem of circular economy in, in the heart of Caerphilly. And I'm, I'm actually looking at taking on a second space at the moment um, in a newly developed area and doing a more higher market product, just seeing that there's so much demand in Caerphilly for a variety of things. The high street is dying there and I just want to be a part of it. So it's just come about from that. The purpose that you mentioned there, you know, that that is always seems to be uh, a really strong driver for, for people to accelerate and, and, and grow, uh, you want to grow something special. 
you know, yeah. having, having a, a, a kind of purpose that's beyond just retail money, that kind of thing, you know, that you mentioned about the opportunities and, and, and things like that. But fantastic that it's, you know, so, so fresh, really so fresh and new, um, but already exceeding the expectations, um, yeah. quite, you know, considerably as well. Um, but I love the, the, also the finding the way kind of, uh, approach as well, where you, you know, like I kind of tried this and thought, hang on, and, and spotting that opportunity as well, um, yeah. is 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 really great to hear. Um, has, I mean, you mentioned a little bit about the kind of length of opening and, and from the concept to to realization. You know, how has the journey been? What you ex- expected so far? Yes and no. I think some of the hardest challenges have been the mundane challenges like electricity. Wi-Fi. Those things took a lot longer than I anticipated. And the interesting thing is I've I've managed to negotiate a short-term lease with the space I'm in just to test the idea. I didn't want to go, yeah, let's go for a three-year lease. So I managed to get six months. And one of the biggest challenges was trying to create an, a welcoming space that sort of uh, elaborates on the, the concept you're trying to deliver without having to spend thousands on decorating because that wasn't part of the the agreement. So I've had to get really, really creative. And so I'm really proud of how creative I got on a very small budget. I don't think I ever anticipated the reaction and the response. It's been one of those situations where I had the idea and I thought maybe this could be something, but to actually see people come through the door in response to the marketing has been an, a different level of appreciation. You know, when you're speaking to customers and go, oh, no, how did you find us? Was it, you know, the sign outside or was it through social media? And, you know, 98% will say social media. And it's like, oh, wow. Okay. Wow. And now I've been telling my friends, I've been telling this, and that's been a different kind of, okay, thank you. So like the appreciation for, between me and the customers is different then because it's, it's my own. And then I get to share it with them. So I think in that sense, I I didn't, I didn't ever expect that. The, that level of community seems to be a a big driver there. Like you said about, um, you know, people letting other people know and, and things like that. Um, and, you know, responding on social and, and engaging on, on that front as well. What is it that you think that have driven this early success um and even the success when you were you know just buying shoes and and you know refurbing them and, and selling what do you think that it is that's that's made that successful th- those different stages i think for me it's the testing and being open minded to failure i don't like failure in itself i think no one can openly admit to saying oh i love to fail but it's being able to test the ideas and testing them until you find the solution. For me, with the space, the space is always changing. One of the things I think, one of the reasons for the the main success with the business now in the physical sort of world is because I'm always speaking to customers of what would you like this space to be? You know, when you're shopping, what do you prefer? Is it category, color, or size? And those small things will make a difference to someone's experience in the physical. And then, you know, something as simple as running beginner sewing classes. Okay. What, you know, being led by them, obviously not giving so much that they have to completely create the structure. That's not about, it's not about that. It's about what do you really want to do? What day really would you want the classes and making sure that it is actually founded on their ideas and involving them. I think on the digital sense, it's just been about testing, really researching and testing, seeing what other people are doing on different selling apps and seeing how they're successful, what images do they use, what lighting, how do they position their products and just testing it until I found what worked for me and always learning, never stop learning. I've just continued to absorb more information all Mm. the time. I think, oh, I probably won't ever get better at that. And then you Mm. see something else, which then leads you to test something else. So it's Mm. always evolving. It's, yeah, that's the the listening is so 
uh, you know, that's really insightful that you, you know, you're doing that list and you're asking those questions um, and, and you're kind of monitoring and, and examining what, what others are doing, you know, while, like you say, not letting it completely take over your business and just trying to please everybody. Um, so many business owners and founders fall into the trap of getting really, really passionate about what they do uh, or what they intend to do and really pushing that through really believing and 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 the danger is believing your own hype then and going down the wrong route and and, and all that um uh, and of course you know having a vision having a dream having a purpose is 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 going to be the key but absolutely that listening is is really yeah is really really important that's got to got to be a, a massive contributor 100 percent to 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 uh, you know the journey so far yeah, yeah. I think without it, we wouldn't see the response that we're getting. Mm. I think it's great. I mean, and also having the empathy, you know, there's so many things that are not perfect with the shop. I don't have prices on clothes and a lot of people go, Oh, I don't, I don't see a price. No, just speak to me. Just, I don't, I don't have the budget right now to get tags. And that's the truth. And I think people resonate with that, that it is a difficult climate and, I'm starting a business because I want to do something for the community. I want something in my local area, but I'll also having that conversation when I don't have the budget, but actually just speak to me. And I also encourage people to sort of have a barter and negotiate because I want people to learn that sometimes you don't always have to go with the first price you're given. And it's also teaching skills as at the same time where a lot of people sort of, mm, no, I don't like that. And I'm like, no, do it, try it. And see what happens. You might get something for a little bit lower. You might have a good laugh. And I, I just love that about the shop. And I think that's been one of the best things to see mm. the success and the response. It seems to be really focused on that engagement side of things. I, I love the engagement side. I think that's one of my favorite parts of the business. I don't want to do it just to not to speak to four blank walls all the time. I love speaking to people and meeting new people, learning about their stories if they're having a bad day. You know, I really treat the shop as if it's my living room. <laughs> I've got my little biscuits, got cup of teas. And that's just really part and part of the way I was brought up as well. You know, I know my mum would be killing me if I didn't have any sort of snacks to give to people or no refreshments. And I, one of the things that I really wanted to achieve was the sort of cozy sort of vibe. And one person goes, oh, it's so cozy in you. And I'm like, perfect. That is exactly what I was going for. <laughs> Fulfillment. Yeah. So what's the, what's the big vision? What's the kind of dream uh, or the ultimate goal for, for the business? I think the ultimate dream is to have a space where there's something for everyone. And I know that's probably one of the worst things to say, but when you're a community, I think one of the things is there is interests for everyone, whether it's, you know, a specific kind of garment, you know, rental service, um, furniture, bric-a-brac, the education side, internships, job opportunities. I kind of want it to become a circular economy hub within the community where we are rethinking waste completely on all aspects. So whether a donated item that comes in, sometimes we'll find that we get a lot of stuff from fast fashion that we can't always retail, but it's rethinking that and how can we use those in upcycling workshops? How can we show other people to rethink that waste to create new garments? We see it on social media all the time, but a lot of people are interested in it. And I saw actually someone talk about creativity as being this quite mysterious thing. And I want it to be a more collaborative thing, especially within the community. I want people to share those ideas. And I really want the Circular Studio to eventually become a hub for that, the go-to place in the area. And eventually I kind of want to franchise the idea where that can be replicated in different areas across the country, working within their local economy and working with what works best for them. So whether they promote something more, working with that and really listening to the, that community. So that's the that's the big goal, but however long that will take. I suppose it's in fashion, it's really important that ultimately it's about delivering on what people want because there's, you know, there's obviously tastes and there's so many different tastes as well. Yeah. Um, it's much harder to just kind of create something and, and push it out there and say, this is fashion now, wear this 
it, ultimately if people just don't like it, you know, in whatever number, you're not going to, it's going to be hard to convince people to change their tastes because um, yeah. it's so personal to them, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And I, I see that as well now. There's, I handpick pretty much all of the clothes that go out. So I research a lot before I pick. You know, when you go into a charity shop or whether you go online, you have to have some sort of knowledge on what people will want beforehand. I always say that buying and reselling is so easy when you know what people want <laughs> because you're just supplying and demand, you know. But when you are, when you have that sort of subjective approach, I might have put something out the other day and I actually did this where I had some donated items. And I thought, I don't know if these will sell. And I thought, well, I'll put them out anyway. And then within a week, someone come in. I was like, oh, and pretty much bought them all. I was like, oh, I love these things. And I was like, okay, great. So I can't actually have that biased opinion where mm. I might not like it. Actually, I have got to try and mm. again, test and try something new where, okay, I might not put it out, but someone else might immediately gravitate towards it. And so it is trying to find that balance between my own sort of guided, knowledgeable, what I would go for, and then actually what other people were subjectively like anyway. So mm. it's it can be a challenge in fashion. And that's, again, one of the reasons why I want to open a second space, because I'm immediately noticing a lower end um, customer and a higher end customer. And I don't want to blur them together because it maximizes and lowers someone's expectation. Someone might come in and they, they only want to spend five to 10 pounds. So when I say 20 pounds, that's way too much already. But with other people, they might be, oh, that's amazing. But then I'm underselling myself. And that's really where the idea for the second space has come for, for a more higher end market and menswear, because I have so many men come in and my menswear rail is one rack. And I feel awful because I'm like, I'm so sorry. My menswear just goes out the window. It just goes so quickly. Men come in, they buy it. And then I can't find quick enough. So mm. I was thinking maybe I just have a, a larger selection for men. Mm. Um, and that's kind of, again, where the idea has come from, just constantly learning and listening. Uh, what you mentioned, uh, part of the challenge uh, there around... Um, tastes and 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 even things like that you know sort of availability around then the men's side of things uh, what other challenges do you think uh, uh, you're going to need to face uh, as you kind of grow sizing 100 percent um the average uk women's size is a 14 and i started with my own wardrobe and I, a little bit of a clothes hoarder. So one of the, a lot of the sizes I have at the moment, six to eight or eight to 10. So having an understanding that there needs to be complete inclusion. And I see it as it shouldn't even be a subject. It should just be a matter of fact. I don't want someone to come in and think there's nothing for me here, especially in folk females. And I think the process in like the processing of clothes and how quickly we are able to sort categorize and just make sure that we are in like uh, making sure that we um what's the word i can't even think making sure that we keep an inventory i'm very data driven and the more stock that we get in i want to make sure that we are checking turnover times that we are checking um sort of high demand items so we can make sure we have it in stock and those are the small details for me that really matter in terms of how we can maintain a good income level, how we can actually increase our profit margins. And those small things for me are going to be the biggest challenges because operations is not necessarily my background. And it's going to be something I have to learn or have to go out and speak to other people or hire someone to consult with. So that's going to definitely be one of the challenges. And we're already seeing it now. The space is not built like a warehouse you know it's a multifunctional space so it serves two purposes but we're going to definitely struggle when we start getting more and more donations in and we process and how to avoid not becoming a charity shop and keeping it curated mm. i can imagine you know if someone comes in and you know they're a certain size and they look across and they just don't really see anything for them does that 
risk of them just going, oh, well, I'm not going to bother going in there. They don't have, they, they don't have any clothes in, in my size. And then exactly. just assuming that's it then, you know, the, the kind of risk of, of, of losing that straight away. So suddenly you've got this demand to, to grow kind of like a potential snowball effect of having yeah. to make sure that you've, you're filling those gaps in sizes and things for people, like you say, men's, men's side of things as well. Yeah, exactly. And the, one of the ways that I have tried to overcome that is by saying we are still so early doors and that I've said that I've literally started with my own wardrobe. And this is something that I am working on immediately. I communicate that through my social media as well. And I do say I get new clothes in all the time. So don't think you're going to come in and, you know, there's never going to be anything because I'm getting new pieces in pretty much daily at the moment. So I really want to make sure that people do feel welcomed. And I've, I've literally said, look, it's my fault, you know, or we're not there yet, but we will be. And I want to make, I think that's so important again, just to have that that conversation with the customer mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. people would rather the authenticity in that conversation, the truth, rather mm -hmm. than, oh, you know, we may get it in, we may not. It's just be clear in my opinion. Mm -hmm. You talked about obviously the communication engagement with customers and, and, and some of the marketing you've been doing. What, what do you find is working and, and what do you find challenging on a marketing side at the moment? So I think what works is, the the authenticity and the just the clear communication side of things all of our marketing efforts are focused on the one day of the week which makes it easier because people know then okay second hand saturday sort of in the title so i think that's the easy part that everything that we're promoting is just focused on one day of the week the challenge is being creative and consistent so at the moment, being the only person within the business, I am having to source the clothes, process them, get the shop ready, which can take all week alongside a personal brand where you're networking, collaborating, trying to build up the reputation of the business. And I think one of the challenges then that comes with it is how do you forward plan enough content, create it, refine it, and then draft it to the same consistency that you need in order to really build that engaging community and then mm. have the customer relationship side where you are messaging people, responding, sort of taking the time to comment on similar accounts, getting the attention of influencers you'd like to work with. That in itself is a complete job role. So I think the challenge online sometimes is being able to elaborate those creative ideas in a timely manner. And I think it's one of the things I'm really struggling with, but I've had someone contact me about an internship. So I'm actually looking to take on a digital marketing intern to help with the social media side, which is great. Cause that's exactly what the business is about. You know, where it's, I want to offer opportunities. I'm not salaried at the moment. So that's a, something I've got to be honest with that I can't offer a pay, you know, payment position because I'm not paid, but one of the things that I had from internships is I want to make sure that they have a portfolio that they can use if I can support them to go and get a job. So I will, but it's definitely one of the things I've struggled with. I would love to be more consistent on social media and every week I'm like, Oh God, we didn't post that. Oh, we didn't do that. And we missed a day. And I just, it does feel like you're banging the head against the wall sometimes, but I know it will eventually get there. Even if I post three times one week. I'm like, thank God we posted three times this week. Yeah. Yeah. It's more than most. Yeah. Um, that's, that's a thing. But the worst thing is, is yeah, the, the forward planning is so important because the worst thing is sitting there and uh, on a daily basis and saying, all right, I've got to put something out today or what, what do I write, uh, you know, and having to, to kind of come up with things on, on the fly and then inevitably going to be rushed and, uh, and everything. And, and it is one of the first things that is generally, sacrificed and then of course you've got you know as you mentioned the, the the engagement you know community management and the feedback and the commenting and all that because all that makes a difference as well um, yeah it's so a it vicious does. circle because i can create the con i can plan the content but i can't i like almost allocate time to create it edit it so then you just end up like oh, i'll just put something out with some of the stuff that i've got together and then it doesn't perform and you know why it's not performing because it's not planned. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. And, and then, you know, 
modified for each platform and and across yeah. multiple platforms and, and and everything so everything starts to get a little bit you know spirals out of control <laughs> um, and it becomes overwhelming really quickly because social media as you know is always evolving there's always something new that instagram wants you to try out there's something new that tiktok is pushing and it's having to like have your ear to the ground at the same time and know like yeah. okay we're pushing reels again right do more reels okay yeah. I need to have 10 stories a week. You know, one of the things I'm utilizing, I think, which manages our engagement is stories and just taking people through my day with them and polls, getting people to engage online as they would in the shop. But mm. if I didn't do that, it would be, oh my God, where do I start? Yeah. And, and, uh, it sometimes break your heart, uh, break your heart, knowing that stories are important, but they're going to disappear after twenty four hours, and you think, "Oh, I'll put that out there," and, and then it's gone. I know, <laughs> and then you're just like frantically screenshotting all of the data so you can look back at it another yeah. time. <laughs> <laughs> so, with everything that you've been through uh, so far, and and obviously, it sounds like it's a you know a fairly short journey so far, very early stages, but already a whirlwind. Um, and like you say, keeping up with it all and. Uh, already looking so incredible in terms of the the, the opportunity and the, the difference you can make. What's the one piece of advice that you've kind of taken so far that you could that you would give to another business owner or business leader? I think in my I think the advice I would give would be just go for it. I think I I would have loved to have started a business a lot younger, and. I think I I just went head. I just, I thought I, I just dived into it. And I think sometimes when you hold yourself back, that's when the problems arise because you're not believing in yourself. And if you don't, you're in, you're subconsciously at a crossroads. I think if you don't back yourself now, when you have that really deep rooted desire, you'll probably get to a year's time and go, I wish I'd have done it then. Mm. I think if you want to do something, go for it. I think it would be one of my biggest life's regrets if I didn't. And so that would be my advice to someone. Sometimes there is financial risk. If there's a financial risk. You could go out for food somewhere, try somewhere new. You spend 20 pounds on the meal and you didn't enjoy it. That's a financial risk. It's the same thing. Granted, there's more money involved, but I've bootstrapped this idea. I've mm. not invested thousands of thousands. I've, I've invested barely two grand, you know, mm. and, and that's just me really thinking creatively and, and learning how to cash flow that way. Mm. You know, if, if someone gives you 10 grand, sometimes you just spend it on the wrong things, you know? So I just say, go for it and try new things with little to no money and see how far you can get. I think sometimes uh, they say, you know, if it doesn't scare you, then, then it's not, you're not ambitious enough or something like yeah. that, but, but equally, absolutely. You know, it sounds like you have been, uh, risk averse to a level, not, you know, not, not to the point, uh, where it will break you and not to the yeah. point where it would completely restrict the opportunity. There's kind of that, that sweet spot in the middle, but, um, but also like, like you say, you know, you've been listening along the way as, as well. Um, uh, and, and kind of keeping, uh, keeping quite a, a humble mind about it, but it sounds. Yeah. I mean, even if you make 200 pounds from the one day, you think, oh my God, you, you do think, oh my God, I've made 200 pounds from the business. But that doesn't mean next week you're going to make the same amount. It doesn't mean, okay, that's it now. And sort of, I can retire. It, it means how can I beat that? How can I, you know, almost have be on the, on the edge of skepticism where you kind of think, okay, this is too good to be true, but is it? And sort of test again, just go with the idea and see what else you can bring to the table. But I do think listen as much as you can and really have those open conversations and try and keep yourself as open-minded because I've drafted so many business plans at this point. And I can't say that the business plan I drafted at the beginning is the same as the one six months later, mm. you know, it could be in two weeks and it's completely changed. Even though the concept and the premise is the same, the operations, the partnerships, you know, the, the tactics that we're doing all may be completely different. And I, I think that should be the, the case. Imagine if it was the same, you'd think, oh, that's, that's really scary. So you would, you were correct. 
from the get-go that's just i don't think anyone's that lucky <laughs> <laughs> no that be uh, be flexible be yeah. driven be have a vision but be flexible i love that yeah. that's brilliant um well we will make sure that we point point to all of your locations online and physical locations in the show notes uh to make sure that anybody local can can get there and then to the actual uh, location to, to your uh, to your store itself yeah um and uh well yeah thank you so much for for the conversation i really really enjoyed it and uh yeah thanks for your time and and i'm sure we can probably end up having another one in the future sometimes in a an, an update on on where where you're at with things amazing that sounds great i like to talk about the business it's probably my one personality trait <laughs> <laughs> well uh yeah thanks again sam and uh for everybody listening, you can find the rest of our spotlight, spotlight sessions as well as standard episodes between myself and Rob uh, at playfairmarketing.com forward slash podcast. And obviously you can tune in on major podcast platforms and on YouTube as well and on our social locations. But thank you so much for listening and see you next time. Thanks, Sam. Thank you very much. <laughs>